Within the book of Exodus, we have the fascinating account of God's delivering of his people, Israel, out of captivity in Egypt. And in the, in the midst of God delivering them and leading them to a promised land, he also gives them a great assurance of his very presence. In Exodus 29, uh, in verse 44 and following, we read, I will consecrate the tent of meeting in the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. In verse 45, I will dwell among the Israelites, and I will be their God. And these shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Fascinating picture. God is giving instructions for the building of a place for his presence, uh, and the instructions for the ordination of a priesthood, uh, who will come before God. Uh, in order that the people might be a people of God. And God has promised that they shall know I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. God has sought to dwell among humanity from day one. Within the opening chapters of Genesis, we find God creating the heavens and the earth, creating all that there is, and creating humanity uh, in his image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. In God, we find in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, uh, appears to dwell uh, within and among uh, the creation. He meets with humanity, with Adam and Eve uh, in the garden. They know him, but they disobey him. And the presence of God is removed, or they are removed from that intimate presence of God. But God then calls the people, a nation Israel, and he delivers them out of the hand of Egypt. He delivers them from the darkness of captivity and slavery. And he promises them a land, a place. And above all else, he promises them his presence, that he will dwell with them. We find that within the account of Exodus, that as Moses is up on the mountain receiving instructions from the Lord God, the people become impatient, and so they build, and we find in chapter 32, they build the golden calf so that they may have something to worship. And in chapter 33, they receive a command to leave Mount Sinai, the place where God was to meet with them and be with them, and they're called to move on. And in verse 12 of Exodus 33, Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to God, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. What makes Israel distinct? is that they are a people among whom the presence of God dwells. We find at the end of the book of Exodus, we have the building of this tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and this vestments and place for the priesthood to come in and intercede for the people of God. And when this work is complete in the end of Exodus, 
and last chapter in verse 34, we find the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. One of the interesting things with this tabernacle is that it was movable. And when the presence of God, when the cloud, the pillar of fire lifted off of the tabernacle, they could move it. And the cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night would lead the people of God and they knew that the Lord their God who had delivered them went before them, was going with them. And when the cloud stopped, when the pillar of fire stopped, the presence of God would abide or descend or fall upon the tabernacle and be among his people. God desires to be among his people. We're coming into or nearing Christmas time. Uh, we're in the Advent season. And at Christmas, what we often look forward to is presents, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, -E -E uh, things that people will give to us. The greatest gift that we have, the greatest present that we've been given is the presence of God. We find in John's prologue, John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if we jump down to verse 14, we note that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. One of the interesting things in the Greek, the word that is used for the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or took up residence among us. It is a Greek word for tabernacle. With Jesus Christ, the very God, took up residence here on this earth once again. This time not in the pillar of fire or the cloud, but in a human being. A human being in whom the fullness of God dwelt. All of God. And God and Jesus Christ tabernacled among men among his creation as the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. And he came to open up the way for all people to once again know God, to once again have God take up residence among us, for us to know him in our day to day. This is the greatest gift that we have. This is the greatest gift that we can ever hold and ever possess. Israel, delivered from the captivity of Egypt to be the people of God in order that the presence of God might dwell among them. That is true for the church. As Peter notes, we read in the book of Peter, in Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 9, this applies to the church as it did to Israel. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, as God's people, God's desire is to dwell among us, to be with us as our God, that we might know him, that we might serve him, that we might love him. It's my hope, my prayer for my own life, as much as for yours, that we would recognize 
the mighty hand of God in delivering us from our captivities, our bondages, our sin. And we would recognize the beauty, the gift of his presence among a people whom he is forming and leading, guiding and redeeming. This Christmas time, this Advent season, let us receive his presence and the impact of that upon our lives. The call to be the people of God, to his praise and to his glory. Amen.